<laughs> and hopefully also the people online. Yes. But you, do, yeah, do that's it. Uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so anyway, thank you very much for the invitation. It's my first time to North Shopping mm -hmm. and, you know, just walking here and seeing, you know, the beautiful weather, seeing the river. That's amazing. So thank you very much for inviting me. And please also, as you heard from the very nice introduction, I'm not a sociologist, so bear with me when you... Uh, uh, hopefully, I'm, I've been looking very much forward uh, to this hearing, you know, and interacting with you on, on this topic, but I come from health sciences, uh, so I have a different background. I was trained in um, in public health science at the University of Copenhagen. I did my PhD at UCLA in, in, um, in, in the US, uh, where I, I focused on epidemiology and causal inference theory. Um, and then I, at some point, got uh, came back to, uh, to 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 Copenhagen again. Um, I was asked, uh, or I think we talk about that. I would could talk about different things, but uh, today I'll talk about something that's uh, very close to my my research heart, which is health complexity on one hand and how it relates to the way we look at health problems. Um, and also how we can use large data sets, um, different types of methods. I, I work a lot with triangulation of methods, using different methods to address different problems uh, from different angles. Um, so I'll give you some examples from, from, from what we call the Denlife uh, cohort or the Danish Life course cohort study, which is a register-based study. Um, let me just see. Yeah, let me keep going. Okay. Ah, now nothing is happening here. Ah, okay, I have to go this. Okay, so I'll start with talking about, can you see, I'll step it over here so you can see the screen also. I'll talk about something that I've been using a lot of time on in the past two or three years. It's actually interesting when I was invited here. Um, it says IS, um, and I thought it was the Institute of Advanced Studies. Uh, you probably heard that before, but I was recently in an Institute of Advanced Study in Amsterdam for half a year on a sabbatical. They um, focus on complexity science in general and how it applies to very different fields. Um, and I worked for half a year, really, you know, no teaching, no uh, other obligation, just focusing on how complex, it, uh, complex system approaches can be useful for health. Uh, research. So this is where I will start. Uh, and this is, um, essentially, this is very simple, but health is a complex phenomenon, and we need to embrace this complexity and move away from focusing on single isolated risk factors. That might seem rather naive to a, you know, bunch of sociologists saying, you know, how could you imagine just focusing on one thing at a time? I don't know if you do that. We do that a lot in health research. So we do studies like these ones. Uh, we have people who really focus on isolating the effect of smoking on lung cancer or on smoking on cardiovascular disease. Or um, uh, for a number of years, I was when I was a, a, a young student, I was involved in alcohol research, and we really focused on the effect of red wine on you know different biological mechanisms and how it affected health outcomes, and and. We try to, with a lot of different advanced methods, to kind of isolate the effect of this one thing apart from everything else. Um, and there's there's uh, this whole there's a the, the causal inference literature really has a lot of very beautiful mathematical methods to to support this this way of thinking. Um, the problem is that um, that's not how complex public health problems really behave. So um, they have a lot of different facets. They're constantly evolving. They emerge from a complex and messy world. Think about the mental health crisis. Think about the pandemic. Think about, um, um, just think about something which people normally say, which is simple, like smoking. It's not simple at all. It has lots of contextual things. It has lots of adaptation, you know, industry. There's, there's lots of elements to this. These are characterized, I would say, by emergence, interactions, nonlinearity, 
interference, feedback loop, adaptation, and evolution, key features of complex adaptive systems. Are there anyone in here actually working with complex adaptive system thinking a little bit? Yeah. More or less. So there's a little bit of, yeah. Anyway, I this is the, the reason here, this is of course a flock of birds, which has nothing to do with public health, but this is the the, um, uh, the picture you often see as an indicator of, or as, as a show of a complex adaptive system, how a lot of individual birds end up doing this clearly emergent pattern. Um, so that's why I put it in here. But, but what do I mean? So, uh, so what's in the top? Oh, that's the, it's being recorded, perfect. So what do I mean by complex? And, and um, essentially what I'm saying is I started out up here in this simple. So I tried to isolate the effect of A on B. Um, and uh, if you go to any, any first year or even last year statistical course within public health, most of it would be about, you know, how to adjust away everything else so you can focus on isolating that one factor. But of course, some people say, okay, but we need to think about multifactorial things and so on. But, but if we can combine them and isolate and understand each of the pieces of the puzzle, at some point, we will end up understanding the total. So that's up here, and this is what a lot of researchers really like. You know, we keep building, and at some point, we get to you know to knowledge. Um, that's you know, so it's it can definitely be more complicated, but complicated is different from complex, and I think that's an important point to make. Complex is when you have some added features. Of course, there's still you know a lot of things interacting, but it's also uh, essentially, I, I normally say there's these three things I think are like the, the core defining elements. Things are interconnected, so you cannot really look at things independent of other things. Um, they're dynamic, so things adapt and change over time. So the idea about, you know, at some point we, we know everything is, is it, is not matching up with a complex system approach or understanding. And then the emergence part, which is the flock of birds, but also that the that the that the, the totality of the public health problems, which is what I'm studying, but it could be a number of other things, is not just the sum of it, its individual parts. So I've been working a lot with what does this mean for public public health? And I know that complex um Complexity theory have been used for a number of other disciplines. I'm not completely sure how the state is with sociology. I know there's complexity economics, for example. I know it's, of course, you know, there's system biology, there's uh, complexity theory in, in physics, uh, in health science. It's not very much, to be honest. So we're really in the in the first. So if it, if what I'm saying here seems ignorant to you, then please, you know, bear with me because I come from a field where uh, this is definitely not taken up yet. And this is really in its 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 very beginning. Um, and then of course there's the, the chaos uh, theories, which is, you know, where, where there's much less order. And I don't know a lot about chaos mm -hmm. theory, uh, but it's, um, but maybe I think, Places where chaos theory might be helpful could be, you know, right when we had the beginning of the pandemic, for example, where you knew nothing. Um, but 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 again, this is not something I uh, know a lot about. So what I set out to work on was to really start thinking about a new perspective on complex health phenomena. And, and apologize for this was a picture. <laughs> <laughs> Online, it's the, the resolution is not very nice, but it, it's essentially, you know, capturing what I think what was my frustration. We were doing a lot of very nice research, but we were answering the wrong questions. Um, and I, you know, try to sit out on the, 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 the other one. I don't know if it's the right one. It's not necessary that complex system approaches is the right solution to this, but I think it can at least help us understand some of the things that we have been ignoring for years in sciences. So um, 
what we, this is what, where I started. And I think what we really need is to look at this, you know, system oriented approach. Um, not so surprising that these are interrelated. So it's not that people have not, you know, um, um, and not discuss the interrelation between you know, mental and physical health and cognitive and, and, and social development. Uh, so it's discussed theoretically. Very few people actually integrate it into their empirical work. Uh, and I think this is this is one of the places where I wanted to you know take it take it to the next step. So so that's of course in the individual, but we also need to think about you know the social, and you probably, I, I would imagine you also work with social network theory and, and things like that, but you need to think about, you know, social network, but also the transgenerational, uh, which is both bi biology, but also, of course, social uh, things that go across generations. And then there's place and community, um, which is uh, also in health research very often uh, ignored. Um, so, so taking different scales and, and different dimensions into, uh, in, into um, uh, account when we, when we do research. And essentially, and I'm, again, I, I, I have this, you know, this is, I like the theoretical thinking in this, but what does it mean? Then I get very practical. And I think, what does this mean for my way of analyzing data and you know building data sets and asking questions and so on so uh, so this is this is where i come from and i ended up thinking you know we need these three dimensions and they relate to the dimensions i talked about later uh, before i'm sorry that i talked about before in terms of complex systems which is patterns, which is essentially the emergence. So we need to describe the emergence of complex public health issues across spatial and temporal scales. We also need to understand the mechanisms, which is the interconnectedness, how elements of the system interact at multiple levels to create complex public health uh, issues. And we need to understand the dynamics how complex public health problems change over time because of dynamical processes. That's what, and I'm not the only one, we've been a group of people really working on thinking, you know, if we wanted to be more systematic in the same way when, when you know, evidence-based medicine was introduced to, if you need a kind of a framework and, a, and an approach um, that is equally systematic and rigid in, in a way and in a positive sense to 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 other otherwise you will never change this paradigm in them. Um, so we started working with these. What does this mean? This the patterns will help us set boundaries for target intervention, address specific vulnerable subgroups. Mechanism will uh, help us identify central leverage point for intervention. Public health we also want to make change. And the dynamics makes uh, it can help us intervene on vicious circles across levels, which generate these excessive burdens of disease. So we combined all of this into a framework which we call the health complexity framework. Um, and it was not only me as an epidemiologist, but we also had two philosophers, a computational scientist, a complexity scientist. So we really interdisciplinary work getting into this. And as you can recognize, you can recognize the three dimensions here, patterns, mechanisms, and dynamics. Um, I think there's two other key points to this is uh, scale that we, um, or a level here, a scale that, that it's not only these dimensions, but it also needs to be across scales and, and interactions across scales from the molecular level to the population level. And I can now start changing myself. And it's a framework for interdisciplinary collaboration. And we've added, and I don't know if you can see it here, but we added some, you know, the patterns um, is we really good, you know, in either in, you know, epidemiology, again, this is from health, but it could also be quantitative sociology, I guess, or social science or data science in general is really good at finding these emergent patterns. When we go to mechanisms, 
then it's we need a different type of approach. So this is where you might need your qualitative interviews. Uh, qualitative studies, but it may also be where you need your lab studies on on uh, on biology or biological mechanisms. Um, and now here the dynamics uh, is often studied in there's a the branch of complexity science uh, uh, from network studies to system dynamics models and 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 so on. Um, but of course, you can also understand a lot about dynamics by looking at things that actually change. So when there's a made it, you know, was there's a policy change or when there's a, um when when there's a, um another, you know, either natural or non-natural occurring change, you can understand a lot about adaptation, for example, um if you specifically study that element as well. So so this has been, you know, one of the things that I've really been working on, and we've also tried within my field. So, so what happens in health science, and maybe you can see a a, a, a similar tendency in in social sciences, is that um, some people think yes, complexity science can or complexity theory can really be helpful. But then we need to, you know, not use any of the methods we've used before, but we need to use only these really new methods that directly come from complexity science. And again, then I'm more pragmatic and thinking, okay, yes, but I don't think it's only math. It's not a method thing. This is an, uh, um, this is an, an, an epistemological thing on how we understand the world. So we can definitely use a lot of the approaches we've used so far, but we need to be very careful about what how they can be used to address the questions we want to answer, in addition to complex system theory methods. Um, and this is what I, yeah, and this is a little bit, can AI and, 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 and big data help us better understand some of these complex uh, problems? Yes, to some extent. But in addition to a number of other things, I think this is not the only thing that can help us. Yes. Um, and then I just want to show you now I go more into you know some of the content uh, um, of, of of the or the more subject matter research that I'm doing which has been a lot on, um, on essentially social inequality in health. I guess a lot of you work with different dimensions of that as well, so that may uh, relate uh, more. Um, we see this again and again. This is not a specific, but this is the pattern that we see all over. Um, whatever health count, it could be whatever social outcome as well. Uh, with, with, higher with lower uh, socioeconomic position you see a higher risk of most health outcomes and um, so that's very consistent and consistent in even in Denmark and Sweden and in, in, in strong welfare states with um, with uh, with essentially free and equal access to health care right uh, so so what's uh, what's going on uh, has been one of my research areas. And I've been focusing, I, so I started out doing a lot of research on stress. Uh, in general, I've been working also with work-related stress and um, stress related to um, uh, caregiving, for example, so people who take care of a chronically uh, ill uh, partner. Um, but I slowly realized that the most important things in terms of you know stress reactions and long-term stress reactions actually seem to be happening in childhood. So the major things that you're exposed to during childhood may not only affect you then, but also set your you know kind of your social trajectory and how you handle um, later life um, uh, stresses, but also. Um, um, but also biological stress response, which are more prone to um, to to react more strongly to later life uh, stresses. So there's a number of things uh, that that could have lifelong effects. 
And this is why I started looking into these adverse childhood experiences, um, which can be a number of things, and I'll get back to that in a second. What do I mean by, by adverse um, experiences? But, um, but I think the key point is that they tend to cluster intact and accumulate in some individuals, some families, um, and of course, over time. Uh, so in some individuals over time. Uh, and there's a little Danish uh, drawing here, but you can, those of you who read Swedish can see it, but it's essentially the same what, what it says up here. Um, or you can just look at, look at the picture. And they are, of course, likely to affect health and well-being during our life course. There's one problem with most of the literature, so that, that I'm not the first one, obviously, thinking about this. There's a lot of problems with the existing literature on, on uh, childhood adversities, because if you do use at least quantitative part of it, if you do use um, survey approaches, then there will be a strong selection that you don't get those who are most exposed to this. You don't get the very vulnerable families. They will never sign up to your survey. Um, so in Denmark, we have a large uh, birth court, the Danish National Birth Court, involving 100,000 women. Um, but of course, it's a very important and valuable uh, resource for, for, um, for research. But of course, it's selected. And it's strongly selected towards women with higher education, mothers with higher education. So if you really want to study this, you need to find somewhere some, some, uh, somewhere else to get this information. And I thought a lot about this, and I, then I started talking, you know, five, eight years ago, starting talking to some of my colleagues, saying, you know, could we, ident what if we thought about all the things we have in the registries, how much can we actually identify if we think, you know, think about combining things and, and how much of this can we identify in registries? Because then we will have an unselected sample. So selection bias was really an important thing for us here. So we thought, so we sat down, we had lots of discussions, we read lots of paper on how people have defined childhood adversity uh, over time. Uh, and clearly we cannot identify all the factors that you would normally get in a survey of type of adversity. We cannot in registers identify whether people have been physically, verbally or sexually abused unless they get into foster care. Then we can start identifying, but that's, that's only the tip of the iceberg. We don't see violence unless it actually gets to the crime records and so on. But at the same time, we thought, you know, it, so on one hand, we had selection problems. And on the other hand, we had problems with having more crude measures. But we thought, OK, there's lots of studies that has the selection problems. Let's try to prove the more crude measures and get as many as possible. Going back to this idea that if we had a number of indicators, we would probably be capturing a lot of the things that we did not, that we could not capture anyway, because they would be clustering. Um, so that's where we started out, and this is where we established the Danish Life Force cohort study. Um, we essentially identified everyone, everyone born in Denmark since 1980, um, and that's now 2.29, I think. Um, so we wanted to follow them from birth and onward. Um, we started out uh, linking nine different registries that would give us indication, and I'll come back to what, what indicators we used. We now have, I think we've linked uh, 16 or 18 different registers, so we keep building this this uh, this cohort. Um, we have information, child adversity, hospitalization, prescriptions. Uh, we're linking to some biological, some of the um, um, laboratory data that you can get from uh, from, from the GPs, um, and, and we also have social and cognitive uh, data. But going back to the child adversities, um, we, from our theoretical reading of the literature, we identified or we decided that we would look into three different dimensions 
of childhood adversity because we thought they were qualitatively different. Uh, so instead of just lumping everything, we, we talked about this, we used these different um, uh, dimensions. One was family dynamics, one was loss and threat of loss, and one was material deprivation. Um, the family dy uh, dynamics that it, we used these uh, four indicators uh, for this dimension, which is foster care, uh, either parental or sibling psychiatric illness, parental alcohol or drug abuse, and divorce. So these are clearly very different things, but they all, so, so all of this can be discussed, can you lump that together, but, but at least they indicated that something was affecting, so we kept thinking about how it's affect the stress level within, for the child and within the family. We thought that was, that, that, that really affected the, the, the family dynamics. Um, Loss and threat of loss is a different thing. That's a, that's a, that's clearly a stressor, which is death of a parent or sibling. You lose someone, um, or you are afraid to lose someone. Uh, so so we we looked at people or families, or children who experienced that either their sibling or the parent had a severe life threatening disease. So specific types of cancer. Um, and so on. Uh, so not any disease, but but for the life-threatening one. Um, and then the last one, and that's interesting because often the the, the material dimension um, is not included in childhood adversity. It's said like, okay, there's the social things, and then there's you know the the social uh, or the the socioeconomic things, and then there's the the distressed things. To me, it seemed like a weird distinction because it's so much intertwined. Um, so we included family poverty and parental long-term unemployment as, a, as indicators of material deprivation. So we used, based on theory, based on reading the literature, but also based on what was available in, in the rest register that we could actually define. And we've, Added to this, afterward, we also now have crime data, for example, which which is an important dimension. I'll come back to that. From this, yeah. Just a clarification. Yeah. How did you combine those uh, variables into a single one, or how did you manage? Yeah. And that's when it becomes. So at some point, it, it does become ooh, because we count, right? And so so what we did was we measured all of this every single so we single year. So in your your first year of life. We said how many, and then we counted mm. within each of these dimensions. So this one had um, three experienced three family dynamics within year one of their life. Okay. Um, so again, this is of course you know for every step of this, it it's it's a reduction of of information, but in in a way to handle two point two million, uh, we we had to. And then it's cumulative over the years, so it yeah, adds up. Okay. No, no. Meaning, no, I, like, I think I can maybe okay. show you in the next year. Um, um, because what we did was we used this uh, group base. Oh, I'm sorry, you also had it. Yeah, I was just thinking I, about. I, I, um, you said like the threat of death. Oh, I'm sorry. Possibility of death. <laughs> Where does something like um, if your parent has multiple sclerosis or something could that fit into? This, because that would seem, you know, having a highly debilitating yeah. disease would seem to be considerable yeah. amount of adversity. I mean, potentially more impactful than just having your parents suddenly die in some ways, because, you know, the other parent now has to care for children plus yeah. spouse. Yeah. Is that sort of left out here? or? I think, I think specifically multiple sclerosis is actually in there. Oh. Um, but you're completely right. There might be a number of other conditions where you you, you might also have, let's say you have, um, I, I don't think diabetes is in there, for example. And for some people, it actually really affects the family. And for other people, it's well-regulated and it doesn't. Um, so we did make some, again, I, I fully agree. So So there's a lot of assumptions that goes into this. And we had to, we had to kind of, rely on the fact that if we had enough indicators of different dimensions, we would at least capture the 
important patterns. Uh, if if you get this, yeah. So and we've done a number of robustness tests on you know if we change this assumption, if we do this slightly different, if we include this only in you know. So we've done lots of different, and it's and it's surprisingly robust. So so I, and I think that's maybe a, something I learned from this also is that if you first kind of get get a hand of the, the important patterns, then then you might challenge all of the underlying assumption. But if you have enough, and this is this is maybe the power of of also having enough data to to actually capture uh, the important patterns and we also looked at you know how does it change over over time because we know diagnostic patterns change over time we know that foster care practices take, change over time and it kept being you know robust more or less uh, over all of these assumptions not to say that uh, so it's not that it's perfect perfect but maybe gives an indicator that if you really work with and that might be the power of of actually of, of of big data if you if you if it makes sense also from a theoretical point of view. Yeah, I also have a follow up question. Yeah. Uh, when you when you said you counted, did you apply some form of weighting? So to say this and that is more severe than. No, we 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 discuss that a lot. I guess it also yeah. gets more complex and then more yeah. difficult to interpret because. Uh, yeah, I was we thought we didn't simply not have the, yeah. so we we talked about these dimensions so we yeah. didn't want to lump everything together yeah but we also did not feel comfortable saying okay having a parent with a depression is worse than a divorce you know we simply yeah. didn't know how to put these weights Wait, were they in, were the example you gave now was it in two different categories but on... okay. that was same category. That was in the same category. But what, what about those categories and rating between those? Did you do something of those? Yeah, so what we did was that, um, and let me see if you can see that. Yeah, so what happened is that clearly, and you can actually see that, and I'll come back to your point on, on the on the, on the the time. Here you see the results of, and um, you see the results of a, a group-based multidimensional directory model. So we essentially said, okay, we, we have defined the three dimension. Let's look at trajectories within each of them and let's try to combine them. Um, and if you look at the scale here, then this is the rate um, and you can see the rate for special needs loss and threat of loss is much lower. So we essentially change the scale, which is you essentially never you should never present things like this because you should see that it's lower. But um, but but what happened when we started looking at it was that we saw nothing on this one until we started scaling it up, because of course you can only lose your parent once. Mm -hmm. So there's simply a thing, but you can be in poverty every single year in your 16 year of childhood. So there's simply something about scale that we had to, so we didn't wait, but we, we actually scaled this middle one up to say, okay, but something is actually happening also on this scale, it's just happening or on this dimension, it's just happening on a different scale. Yeah. Um, and I'm and your question about how we so essentially every single year we said what's the rate, um, what's the rate of of um, so what's the rate of experience problems with family dynamics within and now we have four different groups what's the rate in that group and then in year one it's um. It's about 30% that experience uh, this dimension and it clearly goes up uh, over time. So, but it's not a cumulative rate, it's the rate within every single year. Yeah, so as you said, when someone uh, lose someone in their yeah. family, it's one at that given yeah. time, but not it's zero afterwards, right? No. It's not cumulative. It is so. So it's it's yeah. So yeah. So it's zero afterwards. So the the rate here is that yes. Um, in um in the persistent material the on the uh, I'm sorry in the loss and and threat of loss group here the the orange one there's about ten percent 
uh, every year who lose or have a parent with with uh, so so it's not it's not that of course they probably all of them have at some point something indicating this but they they clearly don't have it every single year no. does it make more less yeah. sense maybe just one additional question would yeah. be how would you uh, um, interpret the y-axis what is this rate adversities per one pay per person, year. person year okay per person year yeah Okay, that makes sense now. So on average, uh, this person would experience uh, a, a third risk of, and, and then of course it's a group measure because no one experienced either your experience or, or not. So it's of course an average one measure. Yes. And, and if I can just, but, just, yeah. To clarify, so you only include people who are born in Denmark. So yeah. Please. Yeah. But do you have any indicators? I would imagine like if your whole family had to migrate because of some kind of tragic reason. Yeah. That would be a like hard family adversity. But that yeah. didn't happen to you personally because you weren't born, but probably affected your parents yeah. in some way. So we have indicators on you know parental origin mm -hmm. uh, in there. So we don't have because we wanted life course data, so we only have people who are born in Denmark and we only follow them until they leave. Denmark, essentially. Um, but we do have indicators on where their parents were born. Um, and I do have a, a comment on, on this. And I'll just show you because what happened is based on these three dimensions, we essentially identified four groups of children. And that was quite consistent in, 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 in Denmark. So that's based on everyone in Denmark, just to remind you. We found one group who we defined as low adversity. So they essentially experience very little on any of these dimensions. Mm -hmm. So they might experience one event at some point during their life or their childhood, I'm sorry, um, but essentially very little. That's a, around half of the children in, in, in Denmark. Then the next group, we call them early life, material deprivation, very little on the family dynamics and the loss and threat of loss, um, but they experience, you know, periods of parental either long-term poverty or long-term unemployment or poverty in, in their first years of life, so before school age, essentially. We find a lot of the parents, young parents who are students here, so, so maybe not so concerning a group, right? It's, it's maybe a natural um, thing. It's about 20%. Then we have what we call persistent material deprivation. So you see, actually, it seems like not so much is going on on the two other dimensions, but they are, you know, in and out of unemployment poverty. And we do see an overrepresentation of people from uh, with, with, with um, parents from uh, non Danish uh, born uh, parents in, in, in this group. Um, we also have a, a group where it's actually where it's not really a it's not a economic thing it's it's really the it's probably more of a health thing so they lose their parents or uh, so it's it's not really a social it doesn't seem to be a very strong social element to uh, or socioeconomic element I'm sorry to to this and then the last group which is of course the most concerning it's a small group of three percent what we call high adversity they experience high rates on all dimensions. And I think maybe what is most concerning it seems to also be, you know, the rate is, is becoming higher and higher uh, over childhood. So it seems to maybe be things, you know, um, accelerating within within the family and, and, and for the child. Um, yeah. In the early life material deprivation group, it seemed like the material deprivation went down towards like, uh, or sorry, the persistent material. Uh, once this it, one. Yeah, it goes down with age. This one. Yeah. How yeah. do you understand that? I think this is, there's, there's a natural thing with, with at least poverty, maybe being rich, at least you're both capturing, you know, the young parents who are, uh, are unemployed in the beginning and then those who, who just continue. So there will probably be a reduced, I'm not, this can also be partly random, you know, variation. Um, so I'm not, I'm not completely sure. I think 
it may be that the parents are growing older and more and thereby also have more probability of, of getting a, a more permanent job. But I'm not sure. I don't have that's just my guessing. Uh, yeah. Sorry for a lot of questions, but what is like the inclusion criteria here for recent for instance uh, persistent material deprivation because it doesn't seem to be persistent because uh, the probability is not the so is it that they some at some point in this period they have had material deprivation and then it may go up and down and even if they everything is fine until they become 15 then it happens and then they are still in this group is that like the inclusion yeah so so we didn't so so just to be clear this is based off a modeling. So we we took that, you know, we, we defined the dimensions and the variables, but we let essentially let the data tell us these groups. So these are clustering groups based on database, you know, on, 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 on uh, empirical data. This group, there will be people who don't necessarily, and pop, I don't know how it's de defined in Sweden, but there will be people who go in and out of poverty, but these are people who repeatedly, yeah. not, not constantly, but repeatedly. I guess. Have. So some people will constantly, and some people will be repeatedly, and that's why you also see some variation in the, in the rate. It's not everyone, otherwise this would have been a one, right? It would have been constantly one if everyone were pop in poverty, you know, through their entire uh, childhood. So, so it's, it's, it's more an indicator of, and we call it persistent. So you could also have called it repeated. So it's, yeah. we we did the naming, so to say, but the but the but the data kind of indicated that this is the right. Thing. I'm starting to get it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Having, for example, multiple children could put parents in this situation, right? If they ah. keep having a child and then another child, yeah. In and out of, um, labor market to some extent, depending yeah. on their position in the labor I'm market. Pretty sure. I'm almost certain that if you were on parental leave, we did not count it here. Mm -hmm. So of course, if it's if you get multiple children and that leaves you completely out of the labor market, yes. Okay. If 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 you are on parental leave because of that, we would not count it here. Yeah. 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 So essentially, this gave us these groups. These are the groups I just uh, that I just. Uh, talked about just presented in a slightly easier way. Um, and, and what we then, of course, again, coming from health, I wanted to figure out what happens to these children in terms of the health outcome. We actually just done a, a, a number of studies also on their social outcomes. And I can bring them here, but I can I can briefly tell you afterwards. So, so what happened, and I think this was maybe what I was most surprised about, um, living in a welfare state with free and, and equal access or free and what was supposed to be equal access to healthcare. Um, we look at here, this is, this is you know, the, the, the ultimate uh, public health indicator is mortality, right? So, um, um, so we look at mortality until the age of, of 35. So that's really premature mortality. You're not supposed to die at this point. Um, and we looked in the four groups here. We had the low adversity here as our comparison, and we followed them from 16 till 35. And as you can see, you know, the, the, the risk goes up here. Uh, the, the, this is the cumulative risk of dying. Um, and of course, you know, some people die, and especially for students uh, during this, uh, this period. I think what I found most surprising was that the small group with high adversity, they actually had a very high risk of, of, of dying in, the, in this period. And I don't think I even imagined that the, that the risk would be so high um, and that we would have groups in them. I, of course, I know that there are you know, social inequalities, but I'm, I, I'm, I must say that, that close to my heart thinking that there's so much, so much of a difference in in um, in 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 something that is that should have been preventable um, in, in in these groups, um, and yeah, 
and because if you look at if you just look at normal social gradients in you know education or whatever you would fin find risk estimates around maybe if it goes high it gets close to two but you would never find something like this so we really identified a very vulnerable group of children um so i've been you know trying to promote that also to the national board of health and so on telling them you know we need to do something here yes uh as a clarification question uh, in the beginning of the presentation you had these three different uh groups the the pattern the yeah. mechanism and the dynamics uh would you say this is more along the pattern yeah. part describing yeah. uh, what you yeah. want to explain yeah exactly i'm sorry that would have been a nice link for me to do but now you did <laughs> thank you very much uh, yes i think what we did here with the essentially with these groups is to instead of you know saying we think it looks like this then try to use the data that we have in denmark and sweden and other places to actually let us understand more dimensions and more um um uh, or, or understand more yeah, yeah more dimensions to to something like social inequality yes so essentially i would say this is clearly an example of looking for patterns um and next step would, of course, be to start understanding, you know, the, what goes on and some of the questions that you've already been asking address some of these issues, saying, oh, but but is it not different if you have this kind of disease to this, you know, going in and see what happens in the families, for example, would be definitely a next step to this. Um, so, so, and and where, um, or what happens, it would be interesting to also look at, you know, do biological studies of their, of, of stress response different, you know, differences in the physiological stress response or, um, yeah, so there's a number of mechanistic studies you could do to 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 support this and, I, and there are things you can do at, at a quantitative level as well. And I'll come, I'll come back to that as well, but you're completely right. This would be an example of patterns. Yeah. yeah, because you you mentioned uh, the importance of selection bias and causal yeah. inference in the beginning. Uh, I, I would be curious how if one tries to uh, address selection biases of different kinds, how how would the patterns uh, change? Yeah, and I, I, I yeah. So the one thing is, you know, how if we compare, you know, these patterns to patterns where we where we talk where we use survey data, for example. We haven't done that one to one because we we don't have that. But but comparing to similar studies, for example, based on the British, uh, there's there's a number of famous British birth cohorts which have been doing a lot of these studies, and they never showed you know um, these strong effects. They've they've shown you know similar pat you know similar effects, but the size of the effect is just much stronger here. My interpretation of that is that because we were able to include all of those you would not include in a survey, we actually got a much better estimate of what's really going on here. And sometimes selection bias is really important, uh, and other times it may be less important. I think for questions like this, it's extremely important that we that we address this. Um, but I don't have a one to one comparison on how it would look if we had uh, done this. Yeah. Uh, maybe you're about to get into this, but what's what's the cause of death? Is the is there yeah. a particular cause of death? That's Here you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> moving you along. Of course, this is uh, this is what the, what people would ask. So most people would say, I don't know if you can see, but I'll I'll get you to it. So first of all, what you can see here is the four group, or the five groups. So the high adversity over here, the low adversity here. Um. You can see what this shows is in general they have higher mortality. That's just what we saw from the other graph. And what is it divided into? Um, the key causes of death in this group of people of young adults is its cancer and its accidents um, and its self harm. Um, and not surprisingly, um, what you see is. Uh, yeah, it says 4.2 um, times higher risk of accidents, 4.9 times higher risk of suicide, probably what most people would expect. But I think it's also interesting to see that there's actually a, 
uh, 1.8% uh, uh, times, I'm sorry, not percent, times higher risk of dying from cancer in this, uh, in, in this group. And we've done, and we've done um, um, follow-up studies on this, and it seems quite interesting and, and, and depressing as well. It's not, it's not uh, that they are more likely to get cancer, but they are more likely to die from the cancer they get. So it's the treatment system that's, uh, or the you know, treatment and compliance system that's that seems to be not working. Um, so, so we're really pointing towards some, you know, injustice in in our healthcare uh, system with these uh, with these numbers. We also looked at and this was all mortality. We looked at hospital admissions, um, all hospital admissions, also for specific hospital admissions. And again, you see, first of all, you see here. Then we followed them from 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 during their whole childhood up till they are twenty five. 24, yeah. Sorry, the other category was the biggest difference, right? Others. Mm. Others. Oh, yeah. Is that, is there sort of a modal, a modal cause in there? Oh, yeah. the Look into that, and not really. Uh, we've done a number of other studies. So this is death, remember. Right. Uh, and it's, it's in this group, it's actually more interesting to look at, you know, uh, incidents of disease. So we've looked into a number of, of other, and it seems like, again, you know, it's also higher, they're also, and I don't have these here, but they're also at higher risk of, uh, of developing a cardiovascular disease, which in this age group, most people, if you go to most uh, cardiologists, they would say, oh, it's mainly genetic. Yeah. But here they are actually have a two to three times higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease high risk of developing type 2 diabetes and 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 so on so it it's um so even with the so they were actually not at higher risk of developing cancer but from dying from their cancer and we're now trying to look into also some of the the other core diseases and see if if it's we know that they have a high incidence but do they also have a higher you know um um or a, a worse prognosis of, 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 of the disease. Yeah. yeah, I was asking just because of, you know you were able to do this study in the US. I would presume that that other category, you might even not even put it as another category, but the, you'd have homicide in there. But yeah. yeah, that would probably be one of the biggest things in others. Yeah. But um, it, yeah. I, I don't yeah. think, I'm pretty sure because we did look into, but there's something about what we can, because we then even with, with last stage and we get into small numbers because it's it's that but I'm pretty sure that homicide was not one of the things yeah, that was so in other yes. because it's Denmark yes yeah have you done similar uh, follow ups in terms of accidental suicides is this is it the same that it's not that they're more likely to try to commit suicide but dying from it or is it that they try in yeah we don't have we ha we haven't actually done that yet to look into of course there's a lot of self harm that you would not have registered in registries um but but there is also you know attempt to self harm and actually uh, actual suicide and we we haven't looked into into that 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 would be really interesting yeah yeah and there's probably a gender difference also that would be interesting to look into I'll try to move on um, and just say, you know, this is for hospitalization. You see, this is, you know, if you just see it on the on the the overall pattern, you see um you see that people, you know, children are going admitted a lot more to the hospital within the first two years of life, not surprising. Um it goes down and and then when we start from 16 and up, it, it starts to slightly increase again because then you get the accidents, the alcohol-related accidents, car-related accidents, and so on. Mental health also becomes a, an issue here. But but what is what is important is if you look at the red one, which is the high adversity group, it's just higher across the whole thing. So it's 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 across the whole board. Uh, so they just admit it for, um, and, and when you look into, and again, looking at patterns, so this is a, an example of looking at patterns. So it's it's not necessarily uh, possible, but it shows us that across all these different diagnostic categories, they seem to just be doing worse. 
And now I keep talking about the high adversity group, but actually the other two groups, and especially the persistent material deprivation group, they also they don't do as as bad as 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 the high adversity group, but they also do worse on on, on a number of these. So don't don't look at the details here, but just see the kind of the the pattern. Uh, can I ask like a complex question? Is it similar in Denmark as here in Sweden that uh, healthcare before a certain age is completely free and then you pay like a small fee to when you go to the doctors or is it always completely free? It's always completely free in Denmark except dental care. Mm -hmm. So um so but but if you go to there's no there's no small fee to go to your DP or to your uh, yeah. Yeah. And so this also makes it difficult because it's not a deprivation, material deprivation issue, maybe because most of the indicators point that it's more of like household or some familial issues that maybe cause the stress. Yeah. Yeah. So I, no I don't think it, it's not a cost issue. This yeah. is, and I think that's the way we've been arguing also in our papers that this is probably the lower, we, we can showing kind of a lower bound scenario of how it may look in the, I know that these results have been discussed in the UK parliament, uh, for example, on, on their discussions on, on child poverty, um, and they cannot do something similar in the UK, so they use this for, for discussion, but, but again, as a, as an kind of an example of, you know, if we had, even with free and universal healthcare, you still see patterns like this. If you on top of that add that you have access problems or whatever, then then it maybe probably would look even worse. Yeah. I think I'll skip it. It's just um or, or maybe briefly. I, I really like this because then it's now we've looked at a lot of patterns. I like to also relate that to some of the theories. Uh, within this, and I really like the syndemic theory, which also fit with the complex system approach. It essentially says it's, it's developed by um, Ting and Claire, that's a, a, a some social anthropologist, saying that um, a pandemic is a set of intertwined and mutually enhancing epidemics involving disease interactions at the biological level that develop and are sustained in the community population because of harmful social condition and injurious social connections. So it's kind of linking the biological level to the social level, and it's probably some of the things that's going on here in uh, in with, with this high adversity group that we are talking about. So I'm thinking, and this is something that interests me a lot, and trying to take that theoretical framework and say, what does that mean for the more looking at pattern in, 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 in data? Um, I'll skip this one. Um, this is a very busy slide, so don't uh, try to look at all elements. But but uh, in terms of mechanisms, we already talked a little. Now we talked a lot of patterns in terms of mechanisms. I think personally, I would say we probably get to the to the limit of what you can do with large quantitative data, and you need an interdisciplinary collaboration to understand that, you know, the dimensions of, of uh, mechanisms, interconnectedness, and, and, and so, so on. But of course, you know, <laughs> being someone who does, you know, data analysis, we've tried what can we do with the things we do. And one of the methods that we've been developing is, is this one, which is called the process of outcome learning. It's essentially turning it a little bit around saying, okay, if we, have a and 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 kind of a pattern of outcome that we don't want. So we have um, a high degree of uh, ADHD among young children. What are the if we use all the data we have and then we go into using more AI based approaches? This is really um, it's a tailored neural network and layer wise uh, relevance propagation combined, but essentially saying. If we have this pattern, what are the potential causes that explains it? Um, and we are still we kind of published on this method. We're now trying to apply it in real life on real data, and it's not so easy, to be honest. Um, but but it's giving us trying from because you could have an argument that now we've 
identified these vulnerable groups, but there might be, if you look at different pen, if you look at mental health problems, there might be some type of groups that are vulnerable that, that is different from the groups of people who are vulnerable for ADHD or uh, something else. So we're kind of turning it around and looking at, at the outcome and trying to explain the mechanisms that give, gives rise to it. And um, yeah, I'll, I can come in three years again and tell you what uh, what happened. <laughs> but we're we're trying. It's it's not so easy with the you know with the, but 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 we'll get there. Yeah, just to to say so that's one way of going into the mechanisms. We're also trying a completely different way, which is really using post experiments on on real interventions. This is uh, one study we also did on the Den Life, saying okay, but we want to understand. Uh, you know, a parental leave reform can change the di or the parental leave can change the dynamic in the family. So if you change or you know extend to parental leave, you might change the dynamics in the in the in the family. Um, and here we use one of the reforms from Denmark. This is I think it's from 1992. I should have followed up on you know, I don't even have the note here. Um, but there was introduced a new parental leave reform with extended parental leave with three extra months for uh, women, for, for men and women in Denmark, who was taken up by women primarily at that time. Um, so we essentially looked at, first of all, we looked at, so we use one of these differences and differences approaches and looked at uh, what happened before and after uh, this, this uh, reform. Uh, first, we had to show that, you know, that they were actually, it, this is when the uh, reform was introduced, that the number of days of maternity leave actually went up afterwards. And it did, you know, the good thing about maternity or parental leave reforms is that there's an almost complete uptake of these. So um, so, so, so there's, a, there's a real change here. And then we looked at... Um, at uh, the long-term impact on 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 the parents' health, on their parents, on the mothers. I'm sorry, the mothers' mental health, and it seems like almost nothing. But there was actually a difference in uh, in in uh, in in risk of of the of the of depression uh, over a 30-year period in in women who had been exposed to this reform and not. And you can talk about. We can discuss settled in this form number because a lot of other things of course happen. I think what was important, ah, I don't have that here, but we actually tried to stratify that by the parents' socioeconomic position also to see if are we are, can reforms like that help specifically for vulnerable families. And what was important, and I'm sorry I didn't bring it here, was that it was actually a much steeper difference for women with low, this was just with low education. So it seemed like the the um, impact on this on on the on the mothers on the women was stronger for women with lower education. So the more vulnerable families. Yeah. So this is a completely different example, actually taking a, a an an existing change in the system and see how that impacts uh, the the mechanisms. And let me see what time we have. Not so much time left, but I'll just uh, say a couple of things. I think I have three or four slides to say what's next on my agenda, and then we can, we already have some discussion, then we'll go on. Um, I think for me, it's really important that we start asking new types of questions. Um, look for diversity instead of averages. Study nonlinearity and feedback instead of assuming linearity. We do that in most of our statistical analysis. Explore interactions, network, group dynamics instead of assuming independence between people. I think you cannot do this in this group. Uh, assessing the importance of context and time and space instead of assuming standardized conditions. Study evolution, change across generations instead of ignoring history. Identify emerging features of a uh, complex system instead of isolating simple effects. That's where I started. So this is to me, and it, and it may seem naive because this is, of course, how the world is. But if you go to at least all of the statistics classes I've ever been in, we start assuming that none of this 
happens. And, and that's just not reality. So how do we develop methods? How do we use data? How do we do interdisciplinary work together that address some of these questions? That's what's important to me. The other thing, uh, and I just got some ERC funding for this, is saying we focused a lot on the, on the social family part of childhood adversity, but we also know that these children are born preterm. They already have biological vulnerability. Not that all of them are born preterm, but there's a higher proportion. They experience infections in early life, mental health in problems in later life. So there's a lot of um, 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 there's a lot of health issues going on. There might be growing up in deprived neighborhoods with high risk of high uh, exposure to environmental uh, things like air pollution, noise. So it's not only, you know, again, I tried to do better, but I also isolated and focused on, you know, only the family, but we need to look at these multiple layers of, of adversity. So that will be the next, and we're currently expanding the Den Life study to include also air pollution data and so on. Yeah, that's actually here, and multi-generational data and, and spatial data. Um, we are also trying, and that's uh, that's Abram. He's a postdoc in the group, but trying to use can we use these metadata that we have across scale? Can we encode them as a kind of a sentence that we can use and study in large language models? Um, and and from that actually look at patterns. So this is we're, we're trying to develop. So one thing is to try to look for patterns, mechanisms and dynamics, but we're also trying to develop methods and approaches to do this. So again, coming from my practical part, I really want to, you know, know how to do that when I, you know, it's it's nice to have this framework, but but I also need to have some tools and, and things. And um, we're actually uh, uh, starting this Copenhagen Health Complexity Center from May this year uh, in Copenhagen, working both with the com concepts of complexity theory for, for health, um, understanding complexity, of course, working with data, uh, very much of what I've talked about today, also developing methods for, com for, for health complexity, but also well, we're actually working with a, a museum in, in Copenhagen, a medical museum, uh, saying, you know, how can we have more lived experience in here engagement research and how does that feed into uh, to, to this more um, higher or, or to this more quantitative approaches uh, to this. And so this will be really interdisciplinary. And so if anyone think this is interesting, reach out. We will also have fellowships and, and things in, in the center. Yes, I think that was uh, all, and we are we still have like twenty minutes for questions and discussions, and these are some of the other projects that I that I've been involved with. Yeah.